in the, uh, in the first session with the, uh, the remarkable insight of, uh, of Hannah. She really is, at the spiritual level, she is being portrayed in this chapter. She had worked out in her mind the, the incredible arrangement that was needed, that God needed a man to work through to help restore the nation. And, and it shows just how aligned she was with God's will. You see, the faithful don't have to guess at God's will. They know his word. They know his expectations. They know his principles. Hannah wasn't lucky to ask for the right thing. She saw what was needed, and she took her prayer to God. Elkanah does not grasp where Hannah is. It shouldn't be lost on us, brethren, that there are two men in this chapter, and neither one understood Hannah's understanding. Neither of them could grasp where she was. Elkanah will bless the, the vow. He will condone the vow. He will support the vow. But we need to recognize that oftentimes our wives can have insights into spiritual conditions that we don't, uh, we don't always see, and we need to be receptive to their counsel. We need to be receptive to their insight, especially with our families, especially with our children, because they can see situations that, uh, that sometimes we can't. But she understood God's will. She prayed according to it. God heard her prayer, and he granted her request. You know, by contrast, again, about this same time, a few years earlier, the angel of Yahweh had to go and visit Manoah and his wife and explain to them they were to have a son, and this son would have to come under a Nazarite vow, and God would use their son in, in, in his service. But nobody had to explain to Hannah that her son should come under a Nazarite vow because she had already worked that out in her mind. If he was to be a teacher of righteousness and holiness, he would have to embrace that as his way of life. So Eli conveys that God will bless and endorse her request. We read in verse 17 and 18, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. We don't know how God communicated to Eli, but at this point in the events, God is still working through Eli. We know that because on five subsequent occasions in chapter 2, Elkanah and Hannah will visit Shiloh, and Eli will bless them and tell them they will have another son or daughter, and they will go home, and sure enough, Hannah will once again conceive. So at this point, God is still working through Eli. And when Eli told Hannah in chapter 1 that God would grant her petition, she left the tabernacle, a happy woman, not happy for her own benefits, but she rejoiced because God was going to bless her vow and participate in this plan of redemption for the nation. She had come in great sorrow, and she leaves in great joy. And, and take a look at verse 10 and verse 18. What changes between those two verses? Penina, her adversary, is still her adversary. The conditions of Shiloh have not changed. The spiritual state of the nation is still deplorable. But what changed between verse 10 and verse 18 is that God had given his assurance. He had committed to grant her request a request that would enable her to increase her level of service to him. And that brought her great joy. Do you see how much faith played a part in her life? Her faith was the basis for her rejoicing in the midst of bitter trials. And she will leave the tabernacle that day and she will go home and finally eat with a smile on her face for Israel's restoration had begun. And you notice again, it's in the midst of her trials that she vows to increase her service so that others can benefit. 
In the midst of her trials, she vows to increase her service so others can benefit. That's the love of God. That's the spirit he's looking to develop in each of us. And it's worth noting that one, one vow is not going to change or solve the nation's problems. But she wasn't concerned about resolving the nation's problems because they were too big for one woman to resolve. But this is also why she becomes a model for all of us because the, the enormity of the challenges that the nation faced did not prevent her from doing all she can. And she trusts that God will take her offering and use it as he sees fit. And brethren and sisters and young people, the beauty of her example is this is the exact same spiritual outlook that God is looking to develop in each of us. He will purposely put us in situations in which the problems are too enormous for one person to resolve, or maybe even a group of people to resolve. But he looks to us to do all we can to help the situation and not to measure what we will give based on whether or not it will resolve the conflict or the issue or whatever it is. He looks for us to do all we can, knowing it won't solve the problem, but trusting that he will take our contribution as meager as it may be and use it in his wisdom. We need to be teaching our children and our young people this is how God works. He will put us in these kinds of situations that sometimes can appear to be very perplexing and can, be, and, and can leave us confused or discouraged, that challenge our faith. But he, that's how he grows our faith. That's as we know how he develops us. He purposely brings people like Penina into our lives and situations like Shiloh into our lives and barrenness. And men like Hophni and Phinehas, these didn't happen accidentally. God didn't make Hophni and Phinehas into the wicked men that they were. But God uses these situations. In the life of Joseph, remember, he brought great evil into the life of Joseph. He does that, looking for us to trust him so that we will pour out our soul to him in earnest and sobbing prayer, pleading with him to save us out of these situations, imploring him to act on our behalf. Get a picture of Hannah in the temple that day, pleading with God, pouring out her soul. The Hebrew word takes us back to the sacrifices in the, uh, under the law of Moses. That's what you did with the sacrifices. She became a living sacrifice in the temple that day, asking God to intervene. And God does all of this to expose our weaknesses, to expose the fact that we are unable to solve the dilemmas we are in, so that we will turn to him in earnest prayer. And out of these deeply distressful situations can come great good, provided we respond by faith. Find the time this weekend. Talk to your children, your young people. Talk to your grandchildren. Talk to your spiritual nephews and nieces in your ecclesia. Share with them your own personal experiences. This is how God grows our faith. Otherwise, when they come of age and they find themselves in the midst of these trials, it can be very, very confusing. It can be discouraging. But each of us here today have a different story to tell, but it all has a common denominator. Because this is how our God works in our life. We have Naomi's in our ecclesias. Sisters who left the house of bread to seek the goods of Moab only to find disaster and the need to return. We also have Ruth's who forsook all that Moab offered 
because of the reward that was to be found with God's people. We have Joseph's in our midst who have felt forsaken by God because of the circumstances that were brought into his life. We have Judah's in our midst who rebelled against God's ways until he could finally see the wisdom and the beauty and the wonder of God's truth and came to embrace it. We have Jacob's in our midst who have learned in their lives that real strength is to be found by weeping and in tears. Who have learned the lesson that it's strong crying and tears unto him who is able to save us from death. That's where the real strength and life is. We have Elijah's in our midst to have had to deal with deep depression and discouragement. And we have David's who have fallen from grace and then have found the wonder of forgiveness and have passed through the door of Psalm 51 and can sing of the blessing of God's mercy and grace. We have Mordecai's in our midst who took a stand for God only to find that having taken a stand for the truth made their life that much more difficult. We have Samson's who could not resist the pleasures of sin and have paid a high price but finally learned that a life lived after the flesh is no life at all. You see, when we share our life stories with the young people, we make the principles of the Bible come alive. And I'm not talking about sharing these in public, but find opportunity to share with the young people. You know in the world that we live that they are going to face temptations that we never did in our youth because the Bible tells us they will face these. We have to prepare them. And we have to prepare them both in a way of advancing the power of the word, but we also have to prepare them in sharing the mercy and the grace of our Heavenly Father. How he brings us through when we fail, provided we conform to his righteous requirements. These are invaluable lessons that we can share with our young people. And, and they're necessary because it helps in time of need. Hannah's faith, her faithful response to her trials becomes the, uh, a model for all disciples. She is drawn closer to God in prayer as a result of her trials. Her faith is strengthened. Verse 12 says she continued in prayer for a long period. Verse 16 talks about the abundance of her prayer. This is not Israel in the wilderness, complaining of God's apparent mistreatment. This is a faithful woman. Spiritual men and women ponder ecclesial problems. They do. They carry the problems with them. They are burdened by them. They are driven to tears by them. And they take their tears to God and plead for his help. Multiple prayers are offered. And, and you notice that while Hannah faced bitter trials, she never let the bitterness of her trials turn her bitter against God. And it's important that we not confuse those two issues. She has great sadness, but she is not a bitter woman. And you see, too, the, uh, the lesson for parents. Her vow that her son would be a Nazarite required that he separate, be separate from the evil and have a lifetime of service to God. And she recognizes this, as we mentioned before, even before Samuel is conceived, because she can see the wicked world that she lived in. And it's no different with us, brethren and sisters. As parents, these are the principles that we need to Teach our children. This is how you raise a godly seed in the midst of a world consumed by idolatry and immorality. In Hannah's case, it was even existent in the household of faith. We need to follow her example 
and teach our children to learn to live apart from the evil and to make holiness their standard of conduct and set the expectation for them that they will be lifelong servants of God. It can be done. Samuel is proof that it can be done. And we need to recognize that God is just as committed to seeing our children grow up and learn to love him and embrace his righteous ways as he was in the case of Samuel. We're not saying our children need to be under a Nazarite vow, but they need to learn the lessons and the principles of that vow. We need to teach them to be able to differentiate between holy and unholy, right and wrong, good and evil, as God defines good and evil, not as the world defines it. And it's critical that we maintain God's distinction, especially for our young people, so that when they cross the line of right and wrong, they will know that they are on the wrong side of that line of righteousness. And they will know they need to get back to the right side of the line of righteousness. Most all of us cross that line in our lives. The world would have a very fuzzy line between right and wrong. We need to have a very clear line of right and wrong. So that those who cross it are encouraged to come back to the right side. Another lesson that Hannah teaches us is we need to be discerning concerning the ability to recognize the evil of our day. You see, unless Hannah was able to rightly identify just how evil and wicked her day was, she would not, the world that she lived in, she would not have been prepared to take the steps that she took. In other words, if she had thought things were basically fine, it's no better or worse than it's ever been, she could not have been helpful to God to bring about the nation's transformation. And, and the lesson for us, of course, is it's only when we see the true spiritual state of the world in which we live and the depth of wickedness in, in, in our day that we will be prepared to take the steps necessary to combat it whether it's in our personal life, whether it's in our family, whether it's in the ecclesia. If she fails to discern the evil, she won't take the steps to counteract it. So that the events of chapter 1 and 2 never happen, at least not in Hannah's life, if she did not have the ability to recognize the wickedness that existed in her day. If she had taken the attitude or adopted the spirit of it is what it is, she could not have been helpful to God. It takes a deep level of wickedness before God intervenes to cleanse a society. We saw it happen in Noah's day, we saw it happen in Lot's day, and we know it's going to happen in our day. He's not going to destroy the world when he sends the Lord Jesus Christ back to it, but the Lord Jesus Christ is going to cleanse the world. And there will be many that die and are removed from the earth because you cannot establish a kingdom of righteousness on top of a foundation of wickedness. The wickedness will have to go and all those who are associated with it will have to go. And the cleansing will be as thorough then as we see in this story so that a kingdom of righteousness will be established. But it's critical that we have the ability to see the evil for what it is. We'll just briefly touch on Elkanah. He is a faithful man. <laughs> he just pales in comparison to Hannah. So we don't in any way want to disparage him. Few of us would have had the spiritual insight that Hannah had. We can appreciate her insight. We can examine her insight, we can be awed by her insight, and we can be inspired individually to have that kind of insight when it comes to seeing the needs of the family or the ecclesia or the community. But we don't want to view Elkanah in a negative way in any way. He may not have been at her spiritual depth, 
but he is portrayed in the record as a faithful man. He takes his family every year to Shiloh to worship Yahweh. He wants his children to learn to have fellowship with God and what that it involves. And he will take his family there regardless of the wickedness that exists there because they can still have a meal of fellowship together and they can celebrate what God has done in their life together. He will teach his family about God and include the children in the worship. He won't stay away from Shiloh just because there are conditions there that are despicable. We know from Numbers 30 that the law required that he ratify Hannah's vow, and he does. Hannah offers her vow, God accepts it, and Elkanah endorses it. When Hannah decided to remain at home, his words were that God would establish his word. So Elkanah is very supportive of Hannah in all of this. And at the time of the dedication, the two of them will go together. So he himself is a very faithful individual. He just is not at the same level of Hannah as the events portray, and as the events unfold. Well, we come to um, the events then of uh, chapter 2. And, and before doing so, we would just make a, a comment. You know, we, we read the Ways of Providence many years ago and were impressed with how Brother Roberts had the ability to go through Scripture and, and see the hand of God at work. And uh, that's, that's an aspect, I suppose, a, a way of looking at Scripture that has uh, been in, in, uh, implanted upon us. Samuel was always in God's purpose from the very beginning. Hannah's vow didn't all of a sudden create the need for Samuel. God knew about the need for Samuel long before Hannah did. But the way had to be made to prepare his mother so that she would come to the point where she would see the need for Samuel. And God prepared Hannah through suffering and through the agonizing events of chapter 1 and the trial she faced. And it's out of those tearful and pleading prayers of a very faithful daughter that she will be brought to the point of where she's now aware of the need for Samuel to be brought into the world. You see, God didn't just appear to Hannah and simply announce to her, which he could have done, like was in the case with Samson's mother. God was specially preparing Hannah so that she would be in a position to specially prepare for Samuel. A far greater child was born into the world than in the case of Samson, and he had a far greater purpose. And this child would require a special mother with a special faith who had a special insight. So even though she may give him up at an early age, her influence for Samuel for good will eventually touch every household in Israel. And by the time we're done tomorrow afternoon, you will see that Hannah's influence upon Samuel will touch every household in Israel. Hannah's reference in chapter 1 at verse 22 about her son appearing before Yahweh forever is another hint, another insight into the mind of this remarkable woman. But Hannah went not up when Elkanah went the next year, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up unto the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before Yahweh and there abide forever. Forever, it's the Hebrew ad olam, it's the kingdom age. You see how eternity was never very far from Hannah's thoughts. She's not lamenting the need to give up her son. She sees that her son will be with God forever. She is rejoicing that Samuel will live in God's house forever. So she's not remorseful in any way. And again, we have to be careful. Because on the day of the dedication of Samuel, don't ask yourself, how would I have felt when I'm giving my son over and he will never live in my house again? And then take those feelings and somehow implant those feelings on Hannah and think that must be how she felt. That is not how the record is portrayed. 
She doesn't lament, she rejoices. She saw Samuel's future. My son is going to live forever with God in God's house. That's where her mind was. And it's important to recognize that. Because sometimes it's not easy raising children. All those nappy changes, all those up in the middle of the nights, that's the easy part, folks. Wait till you get to the discussions with the teenagers <laughs> about where they're going in life. <laughs> but it's all necessary. It's all important because our children are going to live forever with God. As parents, we have the most noble of responsibilities of all parents throughout the earth because we are raising God's children. He gives them to us for 15 or 20 years, and he asks us to prepare them in that very brief time period for when he will be their father. Because we know from Psalm 127, these are his children. In this day and age, there's all this talk about planning families and delaying families. This is God opening the womb of our sisters for his children to be born into the world. That's how they understood it in Bible times, and it hasn't changed. But he asks us to take these children that he has known from the foundation of the world and to teach them his ways and how he tries us and how he chastens us so that when they come of age, they can turn to him and he becomes their father. And the way he will treat them will not come as a surprise. And the, lead, the need to live by his principles will not be a surprise. It will not be a burden because we have impressed upon the kids while they were in our care and under our responsibility that this is how God works. And it is oh so wonderful because look at the promised reward that God provides for us. Don't think for a moment in verse 22 that God doesn't hear Hannah's words. If you haven't seen the connection, take a look at the end of chapter 2, at verse 35. When the prophet comes and talks to Eli and condemns Eli for his sins and says, you know, your house and your sons, it's all going to be gone because of your sins. And I will raise me up a faithful priest, in verse 35, that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. What Hannah spoke to Elkanah about in verse 22 of chapter 1 becomes God's promise and commitment in verse 35 of chapter 2. That is how a line Hannah is with God's will. What she speaks in one chapter, God is promising in the next. We mentioned in class number one how it was God who was taking responsibility for raising Samuel. We want to be clear now, we're not in any way suggesting God used the exact same way with Samuel that he had used with the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a very special relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're talking about is responsibility for Samuel being raised. That's what was incorporated in Hannah's vow. She knew that God would have to be involved in the raising of her child. And God took that responsibility on. And we've given you on the, uh, on the screen the five proofs, so to speak. In verse 22, she says that he may appear before Yahweh forever. She dedicates Samuel to God with her offerings. She brought him to the house of Yahweh in verse 24. He's not given to Eli until after the sacrifices are offered. And she tells Eli that Samuel is being given to God. And the lesson for us, of course, is we need to see our children in the same capacity. They need to recognize that God intervened in our life 
to bring them into the world. They weren't an accident. It didn't happen by chance. It wasn't something that was inevitable. God intervened. They're his children. They need to see themselves, not to make them proud or boastful. But there is a purpose for their life, and it's a purpose God has defined and established. And it's all intended to be a powerful, positive force at work in their hearts and their minds so that we retain the responsibility for educating our children about God. But we also want to impress upon them this greater divine purpose that God has in their life. So we come to Hannah's song in chapter 2. It's a joy, a song of joy, and a song of praise. On the very day that Samuel will be dedicated at the house of God. And we want to make sure we see the whole picture regarding that day of dedication. Hannah and Elkanah will come and offer sacrifices. They will worship. And then Hannah will sing her song of prayer and joy. Somewhere next to chapter 2, verse 1. Make sure you have Bible marked in pencil, chapter 1, verse 10, 15, and 16. Because this woman had entered the tabernacle back in chapter 1, a woman in great sorrow, and now she is rejoicing. And what causes her to rejoice? It wasn't that she had a baby. The baby was born three, four, or five years ago. Her song of praise and rejoicing in chapter 2 is not about having a baby. Her adversaries are still present. She will mention the three different sets of adversaries in her song of praise. There's still Penina, and she is spoken of in chapter 2 as still being her adversary. So when Samuel was born, the adversarial conditions that existed between Penina and Hannah did not go away. Otherwise, Hannah would not still be speaking of them three, four, or five years later. Hophni and Phinehas are still the adversaries of God, and the Philistines are still there as the oppressors. So the adversaries are still present. So how can she be so happy on the day of the dedication of her son at Shiloh? And of course, her song of praise tells us how, because of her faith and her hope. Now, you won't find the words faith and hope in her song. But they're there if we can see them. She can see the kingdom. She can see God's king, his anointed, the Messiah, ruling over the earth. That's what her song is about. So when she brings her son to Shiloh that day to dedicate him to God's service, she has joy in her heart because she can see the future. And then she sings of the future she can see. And she sings a vision of God accomplishing his will on the earth. He will achieve a victory over the enemy, verse 1 says, and the outcome of that will be salvation. He will judge and condemn the proud and the arrogant, in verse 3. He knows their actions. He will hold them accountable. The mighty will be broken. Yahweh's adversaries are broken into pieces, verse 10 says. Think of the image of Daniel 2. Here is Hannah singing of God's enemies being broken in pieces. Daniel hears that dream in chapter 2, and don't doubt that his mind would have gone back to Hannah's song. Hannah can see in verse 6 how the dead are raised. And how the despised of the world, the spiritual poor and beggarly, are raised up and made to rule as princes, inheriting the throne of glory. She is singing of the meek, inheriting the earth. And out of heaven, in verse 10, she sees God thunder upon the enemy and his righteous judgments extending to the end of the earth. And once those enemies are destroyed, God gives his strength to his king, the anointed, the Messiah, the Savior. The wicked 
they sit in darkness. You see, she's, you see, she's singing of her joy and rejoicing in the kingdom that is coming when the earth is filled with the glory of God. And she is praising God for that vision. That's why this isn't a sad day. That's why this isn't a song of lamentation. That's not where her mind was. Her mind was on the kingdom. And that's why she could sing her song of praise and rejoicing. And once more, we can see how closely aligned this woman's mind was with the will of God. You see, Hannah reflected a spiritual skill that not all develop. And the skill enables us to praise God by faith and hope, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of evil, even in the midst of very troubling times. And the skill she learned was the ability to see beyond the present evil, to the good that God was achieving. And with this skill, the remnant can still praise God by faith, fully convicted that he will do what he's promised. And their conviction allows them to rise above the trials, to rise above the evil, and to see the good that God will accomplish and the glory of the kingdom that is coming, so that they can sing with great joy over the prospect of their salvation, even though they haven't yet been saved. The kingdom was a reality for Hannah, and she could sing of that reality. And the reality that lived in her heart and mind became a power in her life for good that enabled her to see beyond the present trials. That's how the faithful can endure even when they are living in very difficult times. The salvation that God would achieve for the nation through the work of Samuel, it was already a reality in her mind. And she then sings of that reality. That's what living by faith looks like. And her song is what praising God by faith sounds like. So that the kingdom became a power in her life for good. And it's important, brethren and sisters and young people, that we carry a vision of the kingdom in our hearts and minds not a technical understanding of the kingdom, even though our vision has to be based on the technicalities that the word contains. But it has to be a power in our hearts and our minds. It has to be strong enough to get us through the difficulties, to enable us to see beyond the evil and the heartache. And mothers, do you see how critical it is for you to have a firm understanding of the gospel so that you can teach your children and so that they can develop a vision of the kingdom. Hannah knew her Bible, not just the Sunday school story. She understood the fundamental principles, the eternal principles of God's truth. And she didn't just know what they were, she believed them. And she didn't just believe them, but they became a power in her life. There's over 30 references in the Psalms to Hannah's song. She knew the gospel because it was important to her to know it. She understood the concept of the Messiah. We don't know how she understood that. Did she just have that little tiny fragment from Abraham's promise? We're not given all the details, but we know that she understood the Messiah principle, and it was a living power in her life. She understood what the kingdom would bring. You see, you can't praise God for something that you don't understand. Prophets could write about the coming Messiah and then turn back and want to look into what they had just read, or just written, sorry, and, and inquire further. Hannah cannot praise God about something she doesn't understand because the praise would not be genuine. She knew a Messiah was included in God's future. And she knew a kingdom was included in God's future. 
Without her understanding, she's not going to be in the temple pouring out her soul to God in chapter 1. She'd likely be embroiled in some argument or conflict with Penina. You know, how does she make a Nazarite vow if she doesn't know what it is and its power for good? How does she put her hope in the kingdom if she doesn't know what the kingdom is? And the other point to recognize, and I think it, uh, it really hits home for us, is this close kindred spirit that is portrayed in Scripture between Mary and Hannah. Mary knew this psalm in chapter 2. She likely had memorized this psalm in chapter 2. Not because it was a Sunday school requirement, but because Mary, being a woman of faith, saw the song of Hannah, as other women in Israel would have, as a prophecy of the day when the Messiah would come. So she's not just reciting these verses when Gabriel comes to announce that she will have God's son. Hannah's song was prophetic, and when Gabriel tells Mary that she will be the mother of the Messiah, Mary's mind is immediately filled with Hannah's song. For those who were alive in 1967 and saw the city of Jerusalem taken on by the Jews for the first time in 1900 years, their minds were immediately filled with Luke 21. Bible prophecy coming to pass. When the Brexit vote happened this past June, our minds immediately went to, if they hadn't already, the Tarshish power and how England had to, to separate itself from that alliance of European nations that would be involved in the invasion of Israel. Mary understood that when Gabriel told her that she would be the mother of the Messiah, she stood in that same place and she realized this prophecy is being fulfilled and I am standing in the middle of its fulfillment. Such was the kindred spirit of these two women. And that's why Mary's thoughts go right to Hannah's song. One woman prays God prophetically. The other woman prays God as a reality. Th these two women didn't just think alike and praise God alike. They were praising God for the exact same event. And that's why their two prayers are nearly identical. And this also shows that the Messiah was m as much a reality in Hannah's mind before he walked the face of the earth as it should be for us after he's walked the face of the earth. And the marvel of Samuel is that this young man, this young boy, will grow up to embrace not only Hannah's vow, but he will grow up to embrace her song, and he will make it become a reality for Israel. Like many prophecies in Scripture, there will be an initial fulfillment of Hannah's song. And the initial fulfillment will take place in Samuel's life. It's not the final fulfillment, because the final fulfillment will not come until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Samuel will be the focus of that initial fulfillment. But only because this song, and he likely knew this song better than anyone in Israel ever did, that will become the foundation for his work to redeem and transform the nation. Because as he matures, he can see that his mother and her prophetic song has outlined the path that he will take, and he will devote his life to helping the nation embrace that song so that in his lifetime it will find fulfillment 
and God destroying the enemies of that day. No, the Messiah won't reign in Samuel's life. But the pattern of what the Lord Jesus Christ will do at his second coming will be reflected in the victory that will be achieved over Israel's enemies in Samuel's lifetime. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.